Last week, we began a new sermon series called Lessons from the Toy Chest, in which we are using uh, traditional children's toys to help us connect with timely biblical truths. Years of research and education has taught us that uh, children make significant learning strides through play. Not only do we learn through play, but play shapes the structural development of our brains. Play shapes our brains. I think that's really cool. So while we're learning to take turns in Monopoly or learning basic engineering principles with blocks, our brains are being physically shaped. Playing allows children and adults to explore and identify, negotiate, take risks, and create meaning. And the toys we use to play can be symbols that remind us of those lessons years later. So last week, we talked about some of the lessons we learned through Plato. We learned the magic of imagination, the truth that even when we make mistakes, good things can be made. We learned the biblical truth that we are moldable, that God molds us not only as individuals, but as community of faith when we let God do the work in our lives. So this week, as we learned in our children's sermon with Mr. Matt, our toy is Mr. Potato Head. Now, I have always been a fan of Mr. Potato Head. I still have one at home that I may play with on alternating Tuesdays, because I love him so much. Uh, I love him, and I was born in Idaho, and so I used to get um, Mr. Potato Head like, keychains and toys growing up, because my parents found it amusing. But I love the silliness of Mr. Plato, I, or Mr. Potato Head. I love that you can be creative, although I always felt a little constrained by the pre-made holes. I wanted to be able to put the things in Mr. Potato Head wherever I wanted to put them. But since I'm a rule follower and there were holes, I had to put them in the holes where they were assigned. But I also think there's just something fun about a vegetable with eyes, right? I mean, there's just something amusing about that. I discovered a few things about Mr. Potato Head this week that I wanted to share with you. Mr. Potato Head was invented by a man named George Lerner in 1949. At first, people who purchased this toy, which was um, done through a cereal box advertisement because they were the only ones that uh, he could find that would um, support this idea he had, they were purchasing just the accessories, the arms, the legs, all of those things, and they had push pins that allowed them to be put into a real potato. You didn't get the plastic potato, you got all the accessories and you put them in your own vegetable because they assumed you would have a vegetable to use at home. In 1952, Mr. Potato Head became the first toy advertised on television, and it was the first ad that was aimed directly at children, so we can blame Mr. Potato Head for all those annoying commercials that come on where your children point to the TV and say, I want that. It's Mr. Potato Head's fault. Later, Mrs. Potato Head and other friends joined in the fun, and in 1964, the big plastic potato head was finally introduced. And, uh, and then Mr. Potato Head went on to fame in the movies Toy Story 1, 2, and 3, which is really where most of us know him from. The plastic children's toy, with all of its parts that can be assembled in different ways, can teach us lots of le lessons. It reminds us of the importance of each part, of each accessory that you can put into the potato. And it's the same message that Paul is trying to convey in his letter to the Romans that Dwight read a moment ago. The Apostle Paul writes letters to new Christian communities that he has helped to form in some way. And in all of his letters, he addresses theological issues that that particular community is wrestling with. He answers questions that they may have had. He gives advice on situations that he knows are harming the community. And then he gives practical advice in how to live in closer relationship with Christ. Sometimes in his letters, he lambasts the community when they are not behaving as they should. In his letter to the Galatians, he calls them idiots at one point. And sometimes he compliments them on things they are doing really well, which you can read at the beginning of 1 Corinthians if you want to peruse it. This particular passage in his letter to the Romans comes towards, towards the end of the letter. And the very first sentence that we read starts out with the word therefore, which tells us that everything he is about to say in the next couple of paragraphs is predicated on the 11 chapters that came before it. So we're going to spend the next 30 minutes learning about what he said in those 11 chapters. I'm just kidding. You know me better than that. I've never preached a 30-minute sermon in my life, and I'm not about to start now. So to be brief, in those 11 chapters in Romans, Paul has laid the theological grounding to promote a life defined by God's righteousness. Basically, he tells them in 11 chapters of the lifestyle expected of Israel and now of all Jews and Gentiles who have been grafted into God's family. He tells them how they will live together now as a new people and how they are expected to relate to the outside world around them. 
So this chapter is intended as the kind of practical implications of all of the theological work that he did in chapters 1 through 11. So Paul tells this community that therefore, since they are now a part of this community of faith, since they are part of God's family, they are to present their bodies as living sacrifices, to not let themselves be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by God instead. This last piece is familiar to us, right? It's been used by lots of Christians and preachers throughout the centuries to describe why Christians shouldn't be defined by what society determines to be right and wrong. It's also what we learned last week, not to let ourselves be defined by our circumstances or the world around us or even our own desires, but to let God mold us. Now, he goes on to use a metaphor that teaches them about what it looks like to live in this transformed way. It's a way in which God's values are lived out, a way in which all are equal, valued, and wanted within the community. For most of them, it is a new way to live. It's a radical transformation of the criteria used to judge a successful life, one not based on their money or education or class or religion or other qualifying factors. Instead, this is a community in which the good of the whole will be valued above the good of the individual, a community in which everyone is seen not as male or female, black or white, Gentile or Jew, slave or free, but as brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus. He says, for as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Paul also uses this metaphor in his letter to the Corinthians where he spends much more time talking about what it means to be the body of Christ. As the fledging Christian community in Corinth and Rome and other cities began to grow, the same class divisions that could be seen in society were being evidenced in the church as well. In Corinth, uh, in Corinth one of the issues he writes about in, um, in the first letter is that during communion, all of the rich people were able to come first, and so they were eating the meal that they had as part of communion before all of the people who were poorer came. And so he uses this metaphor of the body of Christ to remind them that they are all one, and they're supposed to wait and eat together as the body of Christ. Certain people in their society were viewed as more spiritual than others. There were the elite Christians and the not-so-elite Christians. It got to the point where some spiritual gifts were viewed as better than other spiritual gifts, and they began to fight among them. There were those who were apostles or preachers or who could speak in tongues, and they were seen as spiritual heavyweights, as the elite special Christians above everybody else, while those with other gifts, like serving and distributing food to the widows, were seen as spiritual lightweights. They weren't the really gifted or important people in the church. Now, I think if we, um, if we think about Paul's metaphor, we do that in our own individual bodies as well, right? We think some parts aren't really important or needed. So I want you all to think for just a moment about one thing you would like to change about your body. If you could change any one thing, if money wasn't a factor and you didn't have to worry about any surgical complications, what one thing would you change? Let me give you five seconds to think about it. Don't worry, you don't have to tell anybody. You just have to think about it in your brain. All right, everybody has something in mind? Now let me ask you this question. Was the thing you chose based on aesthetics or function? Raise your hand if you chose something you want to change because of how it looked. Raise your hand if you decided to change something based on how it functioned. That's much less. Interesting. I'm going, to write, um, I'm going to write an article about all of you. <laughs> we as a society have gotten to the point where a lot of the decisions we make about our bodies are based on what we're told is desirable or attractive. Now, I, in honesty, I probably would have raised my hand for choosing the physical and not the function either. So much so that in 2011, Americans spent just over $10.4 billion on plastic surgery. $10.4 billion. Now, that number most likely includes surgeries that were legitimate for medical reasons, not just cosmetic, but a really big chunk of that was spent on alterations to our bodies for purely cosmetic reasons. We have become so focused on how certain parts of our bodies look that we have forgotten that they actually have a function. Take eyebrows, for instance. 
When most people think about eyebrows, they are usually thinking about how they look and whether they need to be waxed or plucked. Can I just tell you, I, uh, I took Amira, I guess maybe we were in Starbucks. This was like a month ago. I hope she doesn't watch this video because I'm gonna get in trouble. Um, I took Amira to Starbucks. I can't take her anywhere without somebody commenting on her eyebrows which I think are a little overly done, but everywhere we go, people are like, your eyebrows are beautiful. I don't understand it. Anyway, <laughs> we focus on eyebrows a lot in our family. So we are usually thinking about how they look or whether they need to be waxed or plucked, but not many people stop to consider the actual function of those eyebrows. Did you know that scientists believe the function of eyebrows originally, before we started plucking and waxing them, was to keep sweat and rain out of your eyes when you're running through the forest? This would come in rather handy if you were running from a predator, right? It's a lot easier to run when you can see where you're going. Or take your fingernails or toenails. Our fingertips have one of the highest concentration of nerve endings anywhere in our body. So fingernails help protect the tips of our fingers from being hurt. Some scientists actually believe that our fingertips would become less sensitive if we didn't have fingernails to protect them. Or let's take the less glamorous nose hair. When was the last time you thought about nose hair except to think, man, someone should really get him a nose trimmer for Christmas? Even nose hair has a function. It helps filter the air we breathe by helping to catch some of the germs and debris in the air before they enter further into our body. It helps uh, to moisturize the air that we breathe in. Our bodies are composed of a myriad of different but interdependent parts. Everything has a function. Even the appendix, which we talk about like it doesn't, does something very small in the digestive system. Or at least it used to, even if it doesn't so much anymore. Our bodies weren't designed just to be looked at or to be aesthetically pleasing. They were designed to be functional and useful. Now, this reminder that Paul puts in his letters wasn't just for the Corinthians or for the Romans. It's good for us to periodically be reminded too, because sometimes we get so caught up in appearances that we forget the body of Christ was designed with a particular function in mind. Sometimes we get so focused on reaching more people and having larger numbers that we overlook the lives those numbers represent. And sometimes the opposite is true. We get so comfortable with how things are that we don't want to grow because then things wouldn't be as intimate and we wouldn't be able to know everyone's names and everyone won't know our name. Sometimes we forget that the body of Christ was designed with a purpose in mind to make disciples of all the nations. Sometimes we are more interested in the ministries that will get the attention of the news or will earn us good word in the town than we are in the ministries that no one notices. Sometimes we forget that the body of Christ was designed to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and visit the prisoner. Sometimes we are more interested in having respectable worship than we are in being the place that's known for welcoming those who show up in clothes that smell of smoke and stale alcohol. The truth is that sometimes we are more concerned with the length of the nose hairs in the body of Christ than we are with how well the heart is pumping. So Paul reminds us in his letters that we need each other, and not just to look good, but so that we can function well. Alice McKenzie, a theologian, says this, Whatever made Paul think of it, the body is the perfect metaphor for ecclesial unity. It's better than family or a team because you can take a break from being a member of a team. You can go on vacation without your family, but you can't take a break from the parts of your body. Any of us who have ever had chronic pain in a particular body part know how true this is. You can't just wake up one day and think, I'm going to take a break from that arthritic left knee today. It doesn't happen that way. The same is true in the body of Christ. We are stuck with each other, friends. When one part is looked down on or treated as less than others, all of us suffer with it. The body isn't able to function at full capacity, and we don't get to see the full diversity of the body when we are missing people and pieces of our body. When some don't use their gifts, others try to compensate and make up for that missing part, which leads to exhaustion and burnout within the body of Christ. Let's use Mr. Potato Head as a metaphor, as a visual aid. So, for example, suppose somebody crazy was to put only feet together on a Mr. Potato Head which I, sorry, which I just so happened to do. Unfortunately, it didn't fit in all the spots because the feet are so big. There should be two more feet there and there. So it looks pretty ridiculous, right? Looks pretty crazy. Or we could be all eyes, which just looks fun to me. Not really crazy, just fun. 
uh, he could see a whole lot in every direction, but he can't go anywhere, right, or communicate what he sees. He needs feet and a mouth for that. And Mr. Potato Head with all feet isn't going to be able to do much. He can't use his hands. He can't speak or see or hear. He could just get anywhere he wants to go, but he's probably going to be bumping into a lot of things. All of the parts of the body are needed. And as Paul says in Romans, all the gifts are needed to make the body complete. The other central piece to remember about the body Paul is talking about is that we all need something to plug into. How many have, of you have seen um, Toy Story 3? Has anybody seen that one? It's a really good one. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it and you should have tissues because it will totally make you cry. Uh, in, the, in, in Toy Story 3, there's a scene where um, the toys are trying to kind of break out of this jail that other toys have made for them. And uh, as part of the plan to do that, they take all the Mr. Potato Head parts. They don't have the body, so they plug all the Mr. Potato Head parts into a tortilla. And the tortilla kind of flaps around with these feet and eyes. I was going to play the clip for you, but I couldn't find just the right thing. So you're going to have to go watch the whole movie so that you can see this one clip I'm talking about. It doesn't work very well. I mean, he, he gets to where he needs to go, but it takes a lot of work because he's a tortilla, which is flat, and not Mr. Potato Head, which is round. We have to have something to plug into. We don't function as well when we aren't plugged into Christ as our body, as the central piece that brings us all together. Now, our gifts still work. We can still teach or organize or be a good listener. But when those gifts are used within the body of Christ, being powered by the Holy Spirit, the work that we accomplish is so much more than we can do on our own. So what part of the body are you? Are you the blood that helps give energy and nutrients to the system? Are you the feet that helps Christ's word get to the far off places in the world? Or the mouth that helps tell the message? Are you the teacher or the cleaner or the organizer or the listener or the builder? In March of 1981, President Reagan was shot by John Hinckley Jr. and was hospitalized for several weeks. Now, although Reagan was the nation's chief executive, his hospitalization had little impact on the daily lives of most Americans. Now, I'm sure there was some scrambling behind the scenes, but from the outside looking in, the government just continued on, and people in Idaho and Washington probably had no idea about what was going on. On the other hand, a few years later, the garbage collectors in Philadelphia went on strike, and the city was not only in a literal mess, the piles of decaying trash quickly became a health hazard, could you imagine if all of the garbage collectors in the country went on strike? A three-week nationwide strike would paralyze us as a country. In the body of Christ, seemingly insignificant ones, like garbage collectors, are urgently needed. As Paul reminds us, for as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We all have a gift to use as part of the body of Christ, and the whole body is waiting for you to use it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.